so I think this is the cue for me to start. And um, first, thank you, um, Dr. Leo Musavi and University of Liverpool for inviting me to be part of this wonderful series of conversation. Um, I'm very grateful to have this opportunity to converse with our audience from all different geographical uh, regions of the globe. Um, and while uh, this may sound minor, but uh, for someone who has been surrounded by US-centric thinking and practice, uh, how this webinar schedule is announced using uh, different geographical locations was such a refreshing decentering practice, uh, I couldn't help noticing. And so I just kind of wanted to comment that I appreciate it a lot. And partly due to my own personal trajectory as a migrant intellectual and knowledge worker in the United States, I tried to consider a geocultural and historical context of where I do and share my work. So in this regard, I want to acknowledge the continuing history of settler colonialism in the territory of the US before my talk. And Lind acknowledgement is not without controversy as there are debates on how this practice may remain as a mere lip service, especially when it is not accompanied with political and material actions. Um, so taking in such a political engagement seriously and also following one of our uh, previous speakers, uh, Professor Walter Mignola's argument about how our epistemological level of engagement still matters in activating the colonial work, um, I put out my acknowledgement that I resided in unceded indigenous land, especially the homeland of Lenape peoples. I also acknowledge the genocide and continuing displacement of indigenous peoples since the colonial era and beyond. Today's Lenape communities include Lenape people who belong to the Delaware Nation and Delaware tribe of Indians in Oklahoma, the Stockwood Priest Munsee community in Wisconsin, and the Munsee Delaware Nation, Moravian of the Thames First Nation, and Delaware of Six Nations in Ontario. This acknowledgement is to, to express my solidarity with both local and global Indigenous communities for their continuing fights for sovereignty. So in this particular location, uh, my talk today will draw mostly from my recently published book, The Colonial Feminist Research, Haunting Rememory and Mothers, um, so that I can actually advocate for research that works with and for healing knowledge, both in process and as a product. Um, so if I give a... Um, short introduction of my book. My book documents my own transnational, intergenerational, and very personal inquiry, which actually was demanded by my dead mother's haunting memory across time, geography, languages, and ways of knowing and being. And I assume that some of the uh, audience may wonder what I meant by rememory and haunting uh, as we're talking about research. Uh, and these are the concepts that I'll explicate further soon. So please bear with me until I get there. But at this point, I want to bring your attention to a language play that I engage you with to challenge our presumed notions about mother. As you can see on the slide, um, I blur and integrate two somewhat conflicting concepts of motherness and otherness. Uh, while it may be assumed that mother is a figure that give a birth to self, so that certain intimate connectivity is expected and presumed, Otherness is what distinguishes self through differentiation distance uh, from the other. However, um, in working through my uh, own inquiry, I discussed how my own mother had the otherness that I couldn't have access to or understand. So um, I put a slash uh, between mother uh, to highlight that otherness of mother. And then I also discussed how my others became my mothers, rendering and helping uh, nurturing hands for me. So putting letter M inside the parenthesis to reveal motherness of others. Eventually I have recognized, accepted all these figures as my many mothers uh, and this shifting fragmentations and connectivities become important elements of my discussion. Um, 
So whenever you hear uh, me invoking mothers in today's talk, I hope you can consider the shifting relations of mother and other. Through this inquiry, I dare to present a quite messy entanglement of my personal, academic, structural, theoretical, and spiritual relations and selves as educational research and shared my multi-layered process of conceptualizing, researching, and writing my mother's transnational rememory as a collective knowledge project of intergenerational decolonial feminist of color. So uh, with this overview of the, my book, obviously I was not gonna be able to talk everything about, you know, like what I discussed in the book, but I want to open up today's talk by uh, positioning myself as a researcher who commits herself to doing the colonial work, but who is also continuously bound by colonial ways of being and doing, which disconnects me from various possibilities of different words, experiences, connections, and knowledge. So from this positionality, uh, I pose a question. If researchers themselves are not decolonized, is it possible for us to do decolonial work? So um, today's talk, I like to bring our attention to our researcher self, or uh, we can frame it as our epistemological engagement rather uh, than method per se. Since we as academics are trained in reason, logic, science-centric thinking, we desire and seek out various levels of analysis that can explain. With this pursuit of explanation, we often fail to consider that we simply cannot understand or grasp the weight, depth, and complexity of the reality exactly because of our arrogant desire for explanation for everything. Because explanation is possible if we think about it only within the boundary and limit of what we can understand, think, and imagine. Our such a pursuit uh, is in academia more than often accompanied by choosing trendy, popular, or classic theories that celebrated scholars in our discipline use. And we find assurance and comfort, even of our existence and agency in our explanation through our less than perfect, less than complete, and less than successful attempts that may even perpetuate violence we want to stop. Yet, what if not all are explainable? In other words, my argument is that we do need to delink from this epistemological assurance and clarity before we seek for decolonial methodological directives, especially if our purpose is to produce healing knowledge in process and, and as a product. Unless we can confront our own demons and our own colonial habitual ways of being and doing, and um, this is Gloria Ajardo's word, unless we look them in the face and live to write about them, any technical assurance will always find a way to bring us back to the ever expanding design of coloniality. So um, before I dig further into my recent work, uh, dig further into how my recent work has opened up ways for me to address um, this question, I'm going to actually start with my personal context, uh, which may be considered somewhat inappropriate in certain academic discipline. But uh, as I shared, um, as, as the overview of the, my book, my transnational feminist knowledge project began with my mother who died in Korea and then has kept showing up in my life in the United States. So I need to start from here. Since I'm not gonna discuss her actual stories in today's talk, the biographies of me and my mother that I share today are mostly to provide the historical context, which probably allows the audience to also see different connections uh, from uh, where you are uh, located. My mother was born during the time when Korea was colonized by the Japanese empire, which lasted until 1945, which also the end of the World War II. 
while it is not often discussed, Japanese colonization of Korea was coordinated with the extension of the US empire to Asia Pacific region at the time um, through which the United States and Japan negotiated about which part of Pacific Asian region each empire would annex. And after 1945, my mother had lived through three years of the US military government from 1945 to 1948. And then another three years of the Korean War from 1950 to 1953. So quite volatile life experiences there. I was born about 15 years after the armistice of the Korean War. So I didn't experience Korean War, but I'm considered the second generation of the Korean War. I grew up in Korea until 1992 and came to the United States in my early 20s as an international student and have resided here over the last 30 years. And uh, my mother, who had lived her entire life in Korea, passed away in 2015. So we're one of those millions of transnational families who have lived across different continents and countries and regions, which is also a symptom of the continuing legacy of coloniality. And with my mother's somewhat unexpected death, I started to be effectively drawn into what I would call a feeling place, that is the intersection of time and space where dead mothers stay to share their big memories, partly because their wronged experiences, pains and fights couldn't have been said during their lifetime to reproduce what can be marked as a history, whether it's a world history, national history, or even family history. And this feeling place was where I started to pose and work through my methodological questions. So it's important for me to emphasize that these questions, these methodological questions emerged from the feeling place, which was quite unexplainable. So um, I have the three questions on the slide that we're gonna guide today's talk, although not in a linear way. So number one, what methodologies are available to notice and study a reality that exceeds and defies modern scientific ontology and intelligibility? Number two, how can researchers write in the name and practice of research what can never be known or narrated with logic and reason? Number three, what methodologies can be used to work through and with both the personal and collective losses, wounds, and connections that have become your questions? And um, here again, you can probably notice that uh, I'm also highlighting different kinds of fragment fragmentations and connectivity we can imagine as I put slash, like in your, as uh, this slash plus the differentiation between your and our. And, and again, every moment, such utilization of shifting relations and fragmentations become important for me to kind of really work through some of the uh, new possibilities. So um, to work with these questions, which in the central question of researchers own colonized self that I opened up, uh, um, in, in, in the beginning of my presentation. Um, I'm coming back to the concept of rememory finally, uh, because that concept is how I could start to work with a feeling um, place. And I borrow this concept of rememory from African-American writer uh, Toni Morrison's novel, Beloved, which was published in 1987. It is a fictional story that loosely engages with a historical figure, an actual historical figure, Margaret Garner, a young mother who having escaped the slavery was arrested for killing one of her children and actually trying to kill the rest of, of all her children rather than letting her children be returned to uh, the owners of plantation. So with this historical background, um, the fiction Beloved narrates uh, the house 124 in Ohio, where a main character said that an ex-slave mother who killed her own uh, baby when her slave master came to reclaim her children and said this uh, older daughter, Denver, 
uh, were visited by this baby ghost. After my mother's death, I was almost um, hopelessly drawn to this fiction, beloved, since Toni Morrison was explicitly putting out ghosts and hunting in the foreground without any explanation. Um, and, and as I have already noted, explanation can work only within the limit of what we know. So how can we face not withstanding a reality that exceed, um, defies modern scientific ontology and intelligibility? Since I was reading Beloved, I could accept ghostly visitations from my mother. The possibility Morrison wrote really mattered as I was experiencing haunting in a more than metaphorical sense. Rereading Beloved during this time was almost like reading someone else's manual on how to navigate your haunted reality. Someone else's manual at the time, uh, I, I say someone else's manual because at the time I mistakenly felt that this book was not necessarily written for me. This was an African-American history of a slave, but this fragmented, disconnected way of thinking is a reminder and symptom of our learned ways of membering and dismembering through origins rather than destinations. The question is not about how do others become your mother, but how do you notice others who are already uh, your mother's rendering, helping and nurturing hands. So it was as close as I could get at the time and not to look for any equivalence, but to be instructed on how to know things behind things, like how to be in touch with a particular yet shared historicity. Both beloved and I were in that feeling place of her mother had secrets, things she wouldn't tell, things she halfway told. That was the place that we were connected. And that particular yet shared historicity demanded my daughterly responsibility, my ability to respond in our interconnected relations. If such a historicity can be recognized only through fiction, I had to figure out as a researcher what restrict my access to such knowledge, such knowledge in the field of research, which I considered as my field of knowledge. So I want to actually introduce a very long um, dialogue from the book Beloved. And this, it, this is a dialogue between uh, Denver, the daughter, and her mother, Seta, where Seta brings up her rememory. Um, in this dialogue, rememory is introduced as both forgetting and remember us, and both verb and noun. And um, this dialogue reveals real, uh, really profound insight and ways to delink our ontological assurance from um, what is the colonial ways of knowing and being. And so, uh, but I thought it's worth for us to spend a little bit of time to actually uh, read this together. And so um, I'm gonna just kind of read uh, the whole thing and, and hopefully you can also uh, feel like what's happening in terms of uh, rememory. What are you praying for mom? Not for anything. I don't pray anymore. I just talk. What are you talking about? You won't understand baby. Yes, I will. I was talking about time. It is so hard for me to believe in it. Some things go, pass on. Some things just stay. I used to think it was my memory. You know, some things you forget. Other things you never do. But it's not. Places. Places are still there. If a house burns down, it's gone. But the place, the picture of it, stays. Not just in my memory, but out there in the world. What I remember is a picture floating around there outside my head. I mean, even if I don't think it, even if I die, the picture of what I did or knew or saw is still out there, right in the place where it happened. Can other people see it? Ask Amber. Oh yes, oh yes, yes, yes. Someday you be walking the road and you hear something or see something going on, so clear. 
and you think it's you thinking of a thought picture. But no, it's when you bump into a memory that belongs to someone else. Where I was before I came here, that place is real. It's never going away. Even if the whole farm, every tree, grass blade of it dies, the picture is still there. What's more, if you go there, you who never was there, if you go there and stand in the place where it was, it will happen again. It'll be there for you, waiting for you. So remember, you can't, never go there, never. Because even though it's all over, over and done with, it's going to always be there, waiting for you. That's how I come. I had to get all my children out, no matter what. Remember, pick that her fingernails. If it's still there, waiting, that must mean that nothing ever dies. Ooh, like whenever I read, I don't know how many times I read this, but um, still, it's, it's really, really sorry. Because I encountered this dialogue in a feeling place, I want us to pause, not to think, but to feel, although thinking and feeling are not disconnected. Feel this particular epistemological tension that rememory gener generates for most of us. As you can see, rememory simultaneously refers to both forgetting and remembering at the same time. Rememory is both doing and being or non-being. In addition, rememory exists both inside and outside an individual experience, thinking and knowing. It is the picture of what I did or knew or saw floating around out there outside my head. So then who's remembering? Really, can you understand this? Denver thought she would understand this, but Seth knew Denver couldn't. Still, ironically, Seth still shares what she knows about remembering with Denver. This is where I actually notice a possibility. How about you? Will you understand this? Rememory stays in the place where it happened. Thus, rememory is or becomes the place forever transcending the temporality of past, present, and future. Because even if a house burns down, the place is still there. Is the place then a being that rememories? Stay with me here. Take a moment to feel this head spinning way of knowing, rememoring. Can you notice how rememory generates different relationship between you, me, and place, time, space that carries our and your ancestors' rememories? Maurice suggests that anyone can hear or see someone else's rememory. It'll happen again when you bump into a rememory that belongs to someone else. If you go there, you who never was there because where I was before I came here, that place is real. Have you bumped into someone else's memory in that place which is real? Even though it's all over and done with, even if the whole farm, every tree, grass blade of it dies, it's going to always be there waiting for you. So, um, the concept of rememory challenges and defies our modernistic and this colonial ways of knowing the world. If we just summarize a uh, couple of points that uh, we all felt, first, the rememory tells us that sovereign self is not in position or control of one's own interiority, meaning mind, uh, memory, or thinking, because my rememory is floating around outside of my head. So even if you want to keep it secret, it can be out there. There is no such division between self and her environment. My rememory is in the place where it happened. There's no separation. Individuals are not independent because my rememory will happen again to you when you bump into it. Temporality is not linear. My rememory will happen again even after I die. Space and time are intertwined. My rememory will happen again right in the place it happened. And materiality and spirituality are not separate. My rememory, even after I die, is still out there in the world. 
if we who never was there go there, then these ancestors' memories will happen again across time, enter into our memory, and change our consciousness, identity, and embodied experiences. So then where does a self begin and end with the memory? There are no separations. In this sense, rememory is a haunting. When you are haunted, it's not your choice. So I'm gonna get into the concept of a haunting here. Um, sociologist Avery Golden reminds us that being haunted throws us effectively, sometimes against our will and always a bit magically into the structure of feeling of a reality. We come to experience not as a cold knowledge, but as transformative recognition. And I argue this offers a healing power. According to Golden, a ghost is simply not a dead or missing person, but a social figure. And investigating can lead to the dense side where history and subjectivity make social life. So, let me a little more concrete about what it means to encounter rememory or being haunted by mother's rememory. In this feeling place, um, I noticed that making a living and claiming my citizenship on this stolen land represses the memory of a continuing settler colonialism in my flesh, born out of my Korean mother's body. This is how we with different origins get linked, connected, haunted through your mother's dream memories. When you hear me saying your mother's gain, like I like uh, us to kind of get to that slash and um, parenthesis to kind of really remember that mothers can have uh, both mothering and othering fragmentations and connections. And this kind of messy relationships and um, shifting relationships go on uh, with any kind of history. Right? So expecting an equal right in US democracy that is based on black exclusion buries in my flesh the memory of black mothers whose children were sold away and whose children's lives still do not matter. Writing my existence amidst the ongoing brutality of migrant children caged and family separated stores this violence in my body. I am helplessly witnessing these violent acts without much ability to stop them, yet I can be responsible. In other words, I commit to my ability to respond. At the same time, the presence of my Korean body brings out the specters of my ancestors right in this territory, demanding to remember a countless death in an aftermath of Cold War, including Korean Wars, which became the condition of possibility for American prosperity in the 20th and 21st centuries. Now, my mother's rememories demand your daughterly responsibility in this place. So we, the dead and the living, the past and the present, and what has happened here and what has happened there all coexist and are stole in our bodies. There's neither subject nor object. There's neither self nor others. There's neither agency nor fate. There are only inexplicable ties to what cannot be experienced or subjectified fully. It is not about origin, but about innumerable best connectivities. So uh, with this uh, kind of different understanding toward the self as an of connectivity or as an of inexplicable ties that I noticed that through rememory, um, I now want to briefly turn into a Korean American writer, um, Teresa Hak Young Cha's Dicti, uh, which was published in 1980 to like as another kind of lens that allows me to address um, those three methodological questions uh, in that filling place. So Dicte is considered an experimental autobiographical essay that transcends the self as the book, juxtap the, the book kind of shows um, juxtapositions of fragmented stories of multiple women across several continents in different time periods. But this work became significant only posthumously uh, after her tragic death on the day she received her author's proof of the book. 
So what this meant was that none of the readers could uh, ask the author, Teresa Hakyam Cha, any questions about the book. We're left with the book for our own use. And in this work, uh, Cha writes a nonlinear, non-unifying, multilingual Korean mig migrant American woman subject by putting together mostly invisible individual and conflicted collective histories of Korea, as well as embodied interactions and biographies of various historical cultural woman subjects. And so I listed you know, some of the kind of figures that she uh, used to write this book. And um, one example is Korean anti-colonial student leader Yu Ban Sun in early 1900s, Joan of Arc from France in early 1400, um, Demeter and Persephone from Greek myth, Cha's mothers uh, Hyung Soo Ha and Cha herself, written in multi languages of Korean, Chinese, English, and French, with photos, diagrams, and handwritten uh, letters. And so uh, this book, the, her autobiography that juxtapose in incongruent, multilingual, multi-continental, and multi-generational her stories in a multi-representational modes uh, demands readers to know differently. In other words, Chai instructs an inevitability of fragmentations and disrupts easily consumable, totalizing common identifications in gendered Korean migrant postcolonial experience. Um, so I actually uh, kind of sampled a couple of pages from the book to kind of really show uh, what I meant by incongruent juxtapositions. Um, that, that kind of reveal the postcolonial fragmented being and knowing. And so the first, uh, the, the left side, the first picture is the first piece of the book that shows a uh, Korean language scribbled on a wall. And then the second uh, picture, the next to it, uh, shows a text. Uh, the left side uh, is, I don't know if you can actually see the language, but the left side is the French, and then the right side is English, and it's a poem that uh, Cha wrote. And the third picture is um, what looks like persecutions um, either during Japanese colonizations or a Korean War. And then the fourth is illustration of Chinese medical points in Chinese language. And as you could see, what frustrates readers the most with such collage of multimodal stories is that, in fact, the book doesn't provide any titles, context, or captions of what she includes. So there's no explanation of what like this uh, picture, illustrations, and figure mean, and where she got it, and and like uh, what is the context. Um, it, and so this kind of fragmented narratives, images, and sometimes blank pages, I read in dicti resemble what I have seen in my mother's memory. In other words, you can bump into someone else's memory, but that doesn't guarantee that you're gonna understand it. While English is a still a primary language of dicti, Cha brings in um, French, Chinese, and Korean, along with photos, figures, blank pages, blank spaces, and images of handwritten notes. Um, and so with her representational choices, I actually want to turn my attention to issues of language. Because I had to ask, what language can I use to speak my mother's memory that is fragmented? In what language could my mother speak her rememory to me? Our shared language was Korean. My mother and I spoke Korean to each other, but what is a mother tongue for Korean migrant academic woman of color who speaks writes in English as my adopted language with Korean tones? I rarely think in Korean, talking Korean and writing Korean anymore. I'm also fully aware of the power of English in the political economy of knowledge production. Yet still writing my mother in English is such a pain and loss. This is what the outcome of being educated looks like for many migrant and colonized folks with hyphenated names. 
This is a work life and living shared by numerous migrants and colonized, forced, voluntary, or in between across the continent over many, many generations. It is just not possible to separate our individual will from a larger historical, cultural, and political force, is it? But still, personal is not worth to study, especially our mother's personal, right? Who are worthy for your attention as your research participants? Who decides such a worthiness? However, my initial reluctance about how I could write my mother's memory stored in my mother tongue with another language that is not my own didn't stop me. Rather, I noticed that my body who speaks with the two tongues is the bridge, translation, and even poetry. As Vietnamese American writer Wu Bong writes, mother, this is also privilege you made possible for me with what you lost. I also hit what Nigerian writer Chinua Achebe points out. Um, he said, quote, so my answer to the question, can an African ever learn English well enough to be able to use it effectively in creative writing is certainly yes. If on the other hand, you ask, can he ever learn to use it like a native speaker? I should say, I hope not, unquote. At this point, what is my mother tongue and where is my refuse? I want to come back to beloved for this issue of language again. So Sata is obviously not only mother, but also daughter who was, born, who was born into slavery and, and didn't speak her mother's language. After her mother was killed, Nan took her in and Nan who used different words. Words Sata understood then, but could neither recall nor repeat now. She believed that must be why she remembers so little before Sweet Home. Sweet Home is where uh, she was uh, at the slavery at Isadur, except singing and dancing and how crowded it was. What Nan told her, she had forgotten, along with the language she told it in. The same language her mom spoke, and which could never come back. But the message that was and had been there all along. The message is here. The language it carries is broken. I cannot use any language to seamlessly communicate with my mother's fragmented memory. Yet many daughters have fragmented stories, broken languages, and disconnected relations. Disconnections and connection may not be the opposite, as much as the memory contains both the remembrance and forgetting. So memory instructs us that a myth of seamless and flowing continuity or unity of self, language, nation, and even history erases, excludes, and stigmatize anyone or any traces that disrupt their presumed unity and continuity. So everything has to sound logical and reasonable without inconsistency or incongruency. Then fragmented, broken, and severed discontinuous, discontinuities are disavowed and not said, and thus become unnoticed, unthinkable, forgotten, disconnected, and eventually unsayable. Remembering my Korean mother's memory through the memory of mothers in English, like Morrison's beloved Chas Dikti, uh, is to write a testimony of woman's love, will, and knowledge for my daughters. In this task, borders of language, nation, state, geography, generations are all interrupted. This is both an addition and loss, doing mourning and rejoicing together. Fortunately or unfortunately for me, this is living a feminist life. This is being called my bag, my work, my life. Uh, that's both laborious, laborious and loving. And I'm, I'm not doing this by myself connecting and feeling with the beloved and dictate as a mother's rememories to notice my mother's rememory show how stammering discontinuity and seemingly incongruent juxtapositions are indeed the possibilities and potentials for enacting and narrating connectivity. These ties are what constitute a self, ever evolving connections, remembered and forgotten. To be haunted is to notice us linked and the unspoken past of both the here and there always haunts the present. We cannot imagine the future out of what we forget. 
Rememory is waiting here and there for us. Rememory questions the dangerous closure, completeness, and entirety of our understanding of ourselves, belonging, temporality, and historical progress, as well as our relationship with what can be imagined and done differently in knowledge production. Mother's Hunting Rememories teach diverse connectivity as and of ourselves. Remembering acts matter as what has happened in the past is always with us, our present. Even if the past is from another geography, another community, or another place to which we have never been. The power, knowledge, and connectivity we have developed are grounded within our bodies, born out of our mother's bodies, and our body bridges the past and the future. Yet many of us have forgotten those connections to the sources of knowledge stored in our bodies, born out of our mother's body, nurtured and sustained by the earth we all belong to. So then our question is, how can we remember our epistemologies to relearn or unlearn how to do inquiry? Thank you.